According to the media, eating protein damages your arteries. Here's a sensational post from the New York Post titled, You Might Be Eating an Artery Damaging Amount of Protein, New Study Warns. In today's show, we're going to break down the findings and the actual outcomes of this particular study and look at how investigators sought to ascertain whether or not low versus high amounts of protein increase the process known as atherosclerosis or the clogging of your arteries. The title of this particular analysis that was published just yesterday, the 20th of February in Nature Metabolism, which I consider to be a high impact journal. Nature has nature endocrinology, nature obesity. There's a lot of great nature journals and nature sub journals of nature, I should say. So here's the uh, title here, identification of a leucine mediated threshold effect governing macrophage mTOR signaling and cardiovascular risk. Okay, so there's a lot of multisyllabic jargonistic terms in here. Let's just quickly talk about what is mTOR signaling. mTOR is the acronym for a kinase known as mechanistic target of rapamycin, which as many of you know, is a pro-growth pathway with, within the body. Uh, some people like to make the assertion that mTOR is bad and therefore suppressing mTOR is always favorable, but really what we would like is periodic ebbs and flows in mTOR signaling, such as after a meal, which is quite curious because in this particular study, these investigators looked at 23 human subjects, giving them low protein versus high protein containing meals. The sources of those protein are highly uh, suspect, as we'll talk about very, very soon, including milk protein that is enriched in sugar and canola oil, which really should be the headline, that sugar enriched and canola oil infused garbage protein might increase the some of the processes that are linked with atherosclerosis. But it's important to acknowledge, and we're gonna talk about it in the study, I'll just mention it a few different times. There was an animal model arm of the study and these mice, by the way, were genetically manipulated to be deficient or null in the ApoE genotype. So they are highly prone to developing cardiovascular disease and atherosclerosis. Now, in the 23 human subjects, they didn't actually look at markers of atherosclerosis. They just looked at this pro-growth kinase known as mTOR in monocytes from their whole blood in the three-hour window after consuming a quote-unquote high-protein really garbage protein meal. So I think that's important to acknowledge. You know, when these studies come out, the media write these sensational headlines, and we really need to dive into the details of these studies. And I think this particular study is just really egregious in terms of what they say in the discussion. So before we continue on, friends, I just wanna thank you all for being here. Hopefully you're enjoying this content. If you do, I would very much appreciate your likes, your comments, your shares. And since we're talking about protein, many of you eat more protein because you exercise. We know that protein post-exercise increases muscle protein synthesis, strength and recovery. Another ergogenic aid that can help you with your exercise sessions are the creatine-containing electrolyte sticks by Myoscience. What makes this product unique? is that the creatine is enhanced by the presence of electrolytes like sodium, magnesium, and potassium. We know that electrolytes help increase the absorption and utilization of creatine, which is so important as a modality to increase your strength and performance during your exercise sessions. There are over 775 authentic reviews at myoscience.com from people just like you who are using this during their exercise sessions. Please use the code podcast over at myoscience to save. That's M-Y-O-X-C-I-E-N-C-E.com. Okay, so let's dive into the study. Looking at figure eight, which looks quite scary. What do you see here? You see protein-rich foods like protein shakes, steaks, fish, cheese, and red meat. It goes through the digestive tract and it increases plasma leucine levels. And if you look here at uh, section four of figure eight, you see the skull and crossbones increase cardiovascular disease risk. Oh my gosh, protein is damaging your heart. Uh, the graphical abstract tries to insinuate. But let's really look at what they're talking about here. What do we see here? In part three of figure eight, we see this uh, nefarious mTOR C1. As I mentioned, this is just an enzyme. It's found in your liver, it's found in your immune cells, it's found in your muscle tissue, it's found in your brain. This enzyme is everywhere. Basically, when you have energy after a meal, this enzyme uh, increases. So those the source of energy could be glucose, it could be amino acids, it could also be the presence of insulin, by the way. Stimulate the activity of this mTOR C1 enzyme and that will increase the ability of cells 
levels to process some of the nutrients that you just ingested after a meal, it could lead to increased muscle protein synthesis and repair. It's not specifically relegated to the process of atherosclerosis. That's important to acknowledge. Now, in monocytes and macrophages near atherosclerotic plaque, it could be that overexpression, chronic overexpression of mTOR signaling within this particular subset of cells in the particular region of the body, such as the coronary arteries, that that might increase the propensity of those cells to initiate the process of atherosclerosis. But as Peter Atia and many other experts in the field of cardiology have talked about, you also need a concomitant increase in LDL oxidation to initiate the infiltration of these immune cells known as monocytes and macrophages. So again, just trying to make this obtuse association between protein, mTOR, and atherosclerosis, I think is a stretch. And this is what these investigators are precisely trying to do and conveniently, they conclude in the discussion that you should eat more of a plant-based diet, which I think is quite interesting. But here we go. So the investigators looked at whether or not the ingestion of a protein-rich meal, which was just 25 grams of protein, leads to a rise in circulating amino acid levels, which trigger mTOR C1 activation and downstream signaling in monocytes and macrophages. This phenomenon is unique to leucine because we know the amino acid leucine which is a branch chain amino acid. You have leucine, isoleucine, and valine, okay? And by the way, people have been using branch chain amino acid supplements for a very long time. If leucine was specifically triggering or initiating atherosclerosis, don't you think we would probably see much, a much higher prevalence of early onset cardiovascular disease in people who have been supplementing with branch chain amino acids? And I mean, these have been used for the better part of 30 years. I'm not really sure if there's an association there, but I think that's worth considering, especially uh, again, when we get to the discussion of this article. So the authors say, this phenomenon is unique to leucine and not other amino acids and mediates the deleterious functional impact of this signaling on elevated atherosclerosis and cardiovascular risk. So I think this is a, again, an obtuse way to really look at how protein might be linked to the process of atherosclerosis. But let's continue on and look at what the investigators really wanted to look at. Well, they say more than a century ago, it was discovered that rabbits that were fed a protein-rich diet developed intimal lesions within the aorta. Since that time, a substantial body of research across a variety of animal models, including rabbits, rodents, mice, rats, and hamsters, and non-human primates has established a clear connection between high dietary protein intake and atherosclerotic plaque formation and progression. We have recently conducted a unique mechanistic study in the atherosclerosis-prone apoe null mice model and found that high-protein feeding promotes atherogenesis via amino acid-mediated mTOR C1 signaling and subsequently impaired autophagy and mitophagy in macrophages. I just want to mention something real quick here. We've talked a lot about mTOR over the past several years. So if you want to go back to our videos back from starting in 2017 through 2021, we've talked a lot about this balance between mTOR and autophagy. And it turns out that mTOR C1 signaling is a brake pedal for the process known as autophagy. So if you are concerned about mTOR C1 overexpression, for example, and its purported links with atherosclerosis, you can have in my opinion, a protein-enriched meal followed by periods of fasting. So if you eat one to three meals per day and you're not snacking on protein every single second of the day, that would be a good strategy if you are concerned about atherosclerosis uh, to have a, a blend of a transient increase in mTOR followed by a nadir in mTOR and its associated increase in autophagy. Okay. The investigators write, the results from several observational studies suggest high total protein intake and high animal protein intake are both associated with increased cardiovascular disease mortality, although high protein intake from plant sources may not cause adverse health outcomes. And they cite the references here, which I'm going to make another video about to actually look at the granular details of this. However, no mechanistic studies linking high protein intake to cardiovascular pathologies in people exist. Thus, our understanding of the relationship between dietary protein intake and atherosclerosis sclerosis remains incomplete. The purpose of the present study was to evaluate whether high protein intake activates the amino acid mTOR C1 autophagy signaling pathway in people, similar to our observations in APOE null mice. 
In addition, we evaluated the dose response relationship between protein intake and this mTOR pathway, including downstream effects and the amino acid specificity of mTOR C1 activation in both mice and people. We found that the amino acid mTOR C1 autophagy mechanism is activated in human monocytes, macrophages, and that there is a critical dose above which protein intake activates the deleterious signaling of this response. Okay. These results highlight a mechanism present in both mice and people whereby high dietary protein intake via increases in plasma leucine, ooh, now leucine is pretty, pretty scary, they say, uh, inducing a dose-dependent activation of a signaling pathway in monocytes macrophages that is involved in the pathogenesis of atherosclerosis. Now, Here's kind of the problem, in my opinion, okay? Here is the graphical abstract of the human arm of the study. I'm not even gonna speak to the animal model arm of this study because again, the APOE null mice are really prone to atherosclerosis and heart disease. So let's just focus on the 23 human subjects. And there was two arms of the study, study one and study two. In study one, they had 14 subjects come in twice to the lab. The first time, they had a liquid, low-protein uh, shake. There was about 450 calories. The amount of protein, uh, I think, was about 10% of the total calories. And again, the protein sources are garbage. We're going to look at that very soon. And then the next time they came into the lab, after consuming these different drinks, both times they looked at blood samples uh, ensuing three hours to look at plasma levels of leucine, mTOR C1 signaling, and monocyte activation, and so forth. And then in the high protein arm of the study, the protein Again, this was just a, comparing 12 grams of protein versus 25 grams of protein. They, they said it was the very high protein liquid meal was only 25 grams of protein. It was about 450 calories, okay? Then, so for the second arm of the study, they had a similar proportion of, of macronutrients, uh, the standardized protein, low protein meal, which was just 15% of calories from that 450 calorie meal was coming uh, from protein. And then in the high protein meal, when they went to the lab the second time, uh, nine subjects in this particular arm of the study had a high protein meal and they, they increased, how did they get the protein? You'll find out soon, but they added in isolates from egg, meat, and chicken. So this is not even a whole food feeding study, neither one of these, which I think is really interesting. So let's look at study one from the high protein liquid meal study. As scientists at Washington University School of Medicine, the liquid meals were prepared uh, in the metabolic kitchen using various amounts of Boost Plus, which is a, a commercial nutrition supplement made by Nestle. Here are the macronutrients and the ingredients of Boost Plus. The first ingredient is water, then it is corn syrup, then it is sugar, then milk protein concentrate, and followed by canola oil. Okay, so remember, we're looking at just a garbage product. I mean, no one... There's more sugar and more canola oil than protein in this particular drink. Now, they do add in injury, which is a commercial protein isolate product, which is a whey protein product. They also added non-fat dry milk powder. They added a carbohydrate polymer by Medica Nutrition known as Soul Carb. Oh, and guess what? They added canola oil and water, okay? So again, they're, they're skewing the macronutrients here with a bunch of garbage processed food in this feeding study. To be fair, in both part one and part two, the low protein versus high protein, they're consuming the, the same amount of what I think is garbage nutrients. But uh, it, it's hard to really make uh, sweeping assertions from this because the liquid arm of the study is using a lot of processed trash. Now, in the second feeding study, which was utilizing mostly whole foods, again, it was 450 calories of whole foods purportedly, um, but then the added to get the added protein from the real food sources, which were potatoes, beans, onions, carrots, corn, bacon, fats, broth, and spices. Uh, so this was homogenized whole foods. They added a, a blend of animal protein isolates, egg, chicken, beef, and whey. And they replaced both carbohydrates and fat in proportion to the contribution of non-protein energy in the standard meal. Okay, so let's look at what the scientists found. They say, our data support the presence of a threshold effect of leucine concentration on mTOR C1 activation and downstream sequela in monocytes macrophages of both mice and humans. Previous studies evaluating the physiological effects of leucine mTOR signaling have largely focused on skeletal muscle and its impact on muscle protein synthesis. In muscle, an increase in plasma leucine concentration above two times basal values drives muscle mTOR C1 activation, whereas lower plasma plasma leucine levels have no or only marginal effects. 
Although these results demonstrate that the degree of circulating leucine levels govern its impact on mTOR C1 signaling under physiological conditions, our data now suggests that a leucine threshold for mTOR C1 signaling in macrophages can have pathophysiological consequences driving an atherogenic environment that consists of autophagy dysfunction, generation of reactive oxygen species, and activation of pro-apoptotic pathways. It is noteworthy to point out that the threshold of dietary leucine-activated mTOR C1 signaling in macrophages that we identified seems to coincide with the maximal stimulatory effects of dietary protein on muscle protein synthesis at about 25 to 30 grams of protein per meal, suggesting a complex integrated metabolic network of multi-organ physiological functions that ensure optimal health. Nevertheless, it is often recommended to consume more protein to prevent the age-associated decline in skeletal muscle mass and function. Okay, so essentially what they say there is they acknowledge that mTOR-C1 has been largely studied in the context of increasing muscle protein synthesis. But in this study, they make the leap that I think is not really uh, very clear-cut that increasing mTOR-C1 in blood monocytes is somehow linked to the process of atherosclerosis because in the animal model arm of the study of the apoe null mice, meaning they, they have that gene uh, snipped out of their genome that are highly prone to atherosclerosis, that there was an increased expression of atherosclerotic plaque in these mice when they consume diets high in leucine and protein, which I think is really interesting. So essentially there's a bunch of figures here that show that high protein increases leucine and blood levels of leucine are linked with increased mTOR signaling in macrophages. But in the human arm of the study, which was all of four feeding aspects, we don't have any data showing increased coronary artery calcium or increased atherosclerosis. All we have is data suggesting what we already know, and that is that protein stimulates mTOR. It's not revealing, it's not surprising. We know this for a long time. But they use the animal model of the arm to insinuate specifically that animal protein increases atherosclerosis. But that was not found in the human arm of the study. We just have data showing that animal protein or you know whether it's from milk or whether it's from beef or egg in, in the protein supplemented arm, uh, increases mTOR in immune cells. Now, this is not surprising. This doesn't mean that these immune cells are specifically initiating the process of atherosclerosis. Now, remember, immune cells will respond to oxidized low-density lipoprotein cholesterol within the endothelium of your vessels. So if you have high uh, propensity to have oxidized LDL, and you are chronically overexpressing mTOR, potentially that could lead to increased presence of atherosclerotic plaque. But again, this study finding that consuming protein increases mTOR in immune cells doesn't mean anything when it comes to the process of atherosclerosis. Just because we have an animal arm of a study in a gene knockout mouse that is prone to developing atherosclerosis. So I think it's really crazy. So they go on to say atherosclerosis is the leading cause of myocardial infarction and stroke and accounts for more than 25% of all-cause mortality. Results from studies in animal models suggest that a high-protein intake is atherogenic and the adverse effects of high-protein intake on vascular health is driven by amino acid-mediated activation of mTOR-C1 in macrophages. Here we evaluate the dose-response relationship between dietary protein intake and the amino acid specificity of this amino acid mTOR autophagy mechanism in human monocytes and macrophages. We identify leucine as the key amino acid responsible for activating mTOR in macrophages and discover a threshold effect of high protein and leucine intake on this deleterious signaling pathway, wherein dietary protein intake greater then about 25 grams per meal activates mTOR signaling in monocytes and macrophages. Again, this is not really new. We know that leucine and high protein initiate mTOR. Now, why do we really care about monocytes and macrophages in whole blood? We should be looking specifically in the coronary arteries if we're really scared about that. But the scientists say, finally, by designing specific mouse diets with graded protein contents that represent the mouse equivalent of average and high dietary protein intakes in the general U.S. population, we demonstrate the presence of a dietary protein threshold effect in driving atherosclerosis in mouse models. Okay, and that equates to about more than 25 grams uh, per meal or about 22% of total energy intake. Now, remember, most of you listening, all of you are, are not mice. And so it's important to acknowledge that this is an animal model study suggesting in 
genetically manipulated mice that are ApoE deficient that you know, high protein diets might increase atherosclerosis, but uh, it, the, the, the links are very tenuous when it comes to human beings, okay? Because we know that there's many other steps that need to, to go into effect, physiologically speaking, for the macrophage or monocyte to initiate the process of atherosclerotic plaque. And so to me, this study means absolutely nothing in terms of whether or not protein is problematic for your coronary arteries and, and aortic vessels, uh, because we have known for a long time that protein stimulates mTOR. Now, I do think it's quite interesting that the authors are looking at the benefits of autophagy and that autophagy may uh, help with longevity and prevent atherosclerosis. So if you're interested in enhancing autophagy, well, you could eat your protein, you can have your cake and eat it too. You just have pro bolus protein meals and then fast in between meals and don't snack on junk food. Uh, but again, the sources of protein are very artificial in this particular study. Um, and there's a lot of canola oil and sugar. And so how do we know what is causing what? I mean, it's not like they're using grass fed whey protein in isolation uh, and comparing that to uh, fasting, for example, or what have you. We have just, you know, garbage in, garbage out, not really uh, very concerning in my opinion. So I will do a follow-up video looking at the citations here. And also I want to do some investigations on uh, the author's funding and whether or not they're influenced by industry, because that would be interesting. We're seeing history repeat itself often with these particular studies and more and more feeding studies and human studies are now coming out, vilifying animal protein, saying that animal protein is bad, but plant protein is somehow good and safe. Uh, and so I, I think it's really interesting that we're starting to see history repeat itself before our very eyes. And that's why we spent a lot of time talking about the history of Procter & Gamble and cottonseed oil, the history of canola oil, how this machine lubricant that was really popular around where or two, and there was a surplus of supply, how that just ended up in our food supply, the history of sugar, and how the Sugar Research Foundation paid Harvard scientists to write narrative reviews suggesting that fat and cholesterol are a uh, dietary cholesterol are causing heart disease and sugar is benign. And so now what we're starting to see is industry activists uh, paying researchers uh, to investigate uh, different sources of protein and they can conveniently keep finding more favorable evidence to suggest that plant protein uh, is is good and healthy and animal proteins are very unhealthy. But again, the links here are a little obtuse and hard to really totally um, make clear assertions about the mechanism here. Uh, again, because we, we know that amino acid, the amino acid leucine stimulates mTOR. That's not a surprise. The fact that it stimulates that in immune cells, not surprising either. Uh, and the fact that these immune cells can be uh, involved in the process, process of atherosclerosis doesn't mean that stimulating this amino acid periodically uh, in a healthy diet, in a healthy uh, metabolic phenotype and state, doesn't mean that this is initiating the process of atherosclerosis. We know that oxidized LDL uh, and, and other factors, fibrinogen, uh, blood viscosity, high blood pressure, insulin resistance, all these factors drive the sequela that we know to be uh, problematic, and that is atherosclerosis. And so it's... Um, very interesting stuff. I would love to know what your thoughts are, my friends. I appreciate you tuning all the way through to the very end. Thank you for hitting that like button. Thank you for sharing this video as a text message with a friend, and we'll catch you on a future episode down the road.